We are talking today with Frances Moore LePay. She is author of numerous books, including Diet for a Small Planet and Food First and Hope's Edge. She is co-founder of the organization Food First, as well as the organization The Center for Living Democracy. She has received 17 honorary doctorates and was the fourth American to receive the prestigious Wright Livelihood Award, considered the alternative Nobel Peace Prize. And she is here to talk about her new book, Democracy's Edge, Choosing to Save Our Country by Bringing Democracy to Life. If you would begin and tell us what was the motivation in writing Democracy's Edge? The motivation is to confirm what people know in their hearts and give us all more power to be truer to ourselves in the sense that I think this, this book is particularly written to the U.S. audience saying we know it's not working that we're on the edge, this democracy's edge, we're on the edge of losing the democracy, the way of life that we grew up thinking was already sort of assured for us, and we don't know what to do. Now, I, I wrote this book because I feel that there is a whole new stage of democracy that is emerging, that doesn't make the evening news, that can take us uh, away from disaster and can take us into a new, more life-serving, what I call mental map or this new stage of democracy as a living practice. I call it living democracy. Not something done to us or for us by distant power holders, but what we, in a very exciting and rewarding way, engage in ourselves. But we are at risk of losing even the, you know, the barest uh, skeleton of democracy that we have left here. So that, that's really why I wrote this book. All right. So you're saying that there's something more than just going to the polls every uh, couple of years yes, that I we am. need to be and doing? I think the biggest problem, I mean, I, I grew up thinking, oh, we have elections. Oh, we have a market economy oh, therefore, we have democracy. And there's not much for me to do except sort of clean things up around the edges. But actually, elections and a market economy do not guarantee our values being expressed and creating the world that we want. We have poverty growing here, 43% increase in hunger just in the last f five years. We have you know, such concentrated uh, control of our economy that the top 1% control as much wealth as the bottom 95%. So what my book is saying is that if we think that democracy is assured just by this simple combo of, a, of elections and a market economy, we are going to have our hearts broken. Because actually, democracy is driven by the premise of the widest dispersion of power so that all of us have a voice, right? But the market economy, at least the peculiar way we've organized it here, is that it is driven by exactly the opposite premise, and that is the concentration of power, because it is premised on the highest return to existing wealth, people who already own the stocks. And so there is this profound tension between democracy and its wonderful values, dispersed power, which allows in fairness and accountability and openness and inclusion on the one hand, and a market economy driven by the single rule. I call it the one rule economics. That one rule is highest return to existing wealth. So what happens is that wealth concentrates so much that it then infects and corrupts the political system. So now in Washington, there are 56 lobbyists. They're pursuing the interest of a tiny minority, uh, corporations at the pinnacle of our economy, for every elected official that you and I, the citizens, have put there. So we're outnumbered 56 to 1 in our own capital. And so I, I think that the great clarity that, that I'm trying to uh, that I've come to that has really helped me a lot is this understanding that the market left to its own devices actually kills itself <laughs> because it, you know, it, money gets so tightly held that pe there's no more competition and uh, people can't enter and start new companies and that sort of thing. So that it takes a truly democratic political process to keep the market open and that's really where we come in, we citizens come in to say, wait a minute, uh, the goal has to be to get money, the power of wealth out of the political system and the power of democracy into the economic system. If, if, does that make sense? And so my book is all about that and not some pipe dream, you know, some future thing that's going to happen. 
but what is happening right now in our communities and our states that is in fact doing that getting money the power of money out of politics and getting the power of democracy into economics and it's happening and that's my book is filled with stories about how Americans are making that happen you've kind of been focusing on issues like this for quite a while what revelations came to you in this particular work that kind of separated you know this book from your previous work well in some ways this book is a culmination of many many years of trying to sort this out and figure out uh, how to talk about it in a way that no matter who we are whatever line of work we're in that it can connect with us because I, I think that so in that sense, it builds on everything that I've been doing. I started in with food uh, many, many years ago, thinking, oh, if I could just understand why people are hungry when there's plenty of food in the world, that that would unlock the mysteries of the economic and political order. And so by peeling away the layers and layers and layers over many years, I realized that actually there's only one thing powerful enough to keep us in the state where we're creating a society that we as individuals don't want. I mean, you couldn't find anyone who wants poverty in America. And yet, you know, poverty has increased 17 percent. We have one in every four of our children living in living in families so poor they're not even assured of proper nutrition uh, nobody would want that nobody would want you know ice caps to be melting you know what is it now 50 percent in 50 years I mean nobody wants that so finally I, I, I came to the realization that I communicated in democracy's edge and that is that the only thing that powerful is the power of our ideas <laughs> because human beings are uniquely creatures of the mind that's what sets us apart from all other creatures on earth that we develop these ideas about reality that then determine what we can do and what we cannot do what it means to be a human being and right now you and I are alive in this moment where the dominant idea is simply that we have to turn over our fate to this impersonal market that ends up robbing us of the democratic values that allow us to thrive and allow us to be fully human. So we've got this idea that is actually doing us in, this big idea of what I call in the book thin democracy, this notion of this simple notion of elections plus market equals democracy. That's what I call thin democracy that is vulnerable to take over as it now is being taken over by very uh, small uh, private interests, not the public interest. So would that be what you consider one of the myths or obstacles that U.S. citizens have to face in dealing with this bigger picture? Yes, and it's scary, but it's also very liberating. Because then there's a way of understanding. For example, in the paper um, right now is the stories, of, the stories uh, about the Food and Drug Administration and drug testing that it's clear that private interests, the pharmaceuticals, have had undue influence over a lot that goes on in the Federal Drug Administration. And there's a lot of expose now about this. Um, why do we pay twice as much for the very same little pill that people are paying in Europe, for example? Again, it's the pharmaceutical companies, their influence in Washington. So in one way, it's scary to admit it. In another way, it's liberating to say, oh, now I have a frame of understanding, you know, what I call in the book the causal pattern, to see how it is that we got here. And, the, and it's not that, you know, Merck is evil people or DuPont is equal, evil or one of my favorite ones, companies to hate actually, is Monsanto in the food industry that owns uh, 11,000 seed patents and is bullying so many farmers. And it's easy to think, oh, it's just because these bad companies are ripping all, us off. No, actually, it's that we are buying in to a system that gives them that kind of influence, that kind of entree into Washington. So take genetically modified organisms as one example. So they were able to go in, you know, talk to Dan Quayle at the time and tell him, oh, there's no difference between GMO and any other seed, so therefore it doesn't need to be any kind of real testing, any serious testing. And GMOs were spread across our country before, and there's never been any real public debate about it. Why did, who asked for it, right? I didn't. I don't think you did. I, so, so I think that, um, in, on the one hand, it's frightening to, to really acknowledge the depth of the private power in our government. Um, on the other hand, it's very liberating to, to understand how it happened and how we can then change it. I just want to add here 
a stunning quote. Um, 1938, April of 1938, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was addressing Congress on this very topic of monopoly power. And he said, quote, he said, the liberty of democracy is not safe if a people tolerate the growth of private power to the point that it is stronger than the democratic state itself. That, in its essence, is fascism. This was our president warning us. And of course, Eisenhower was so eloquent in how he warned us about the power of the military industrial complex. That's another very, very uh, often quoted uh, statement that we need to wake up and realize that we cannot allow private interest to control the public agenda. So where do you see as the significant points where things changed in terms of making it so that we as citizens accepted these ideas, you know, accepted these limitations? Well, I saw a big shift in the 80s, a huge shift in the 80s in the mystification. I think it's a kind of what I think of as magical thinking. And actually, Ronald Reagan used the term magic. The, the, he, he talked about the magic of the market, this, this kind of magical idea that if we just leave it alone, that it will result in benign outcomes, that we all just sort of compete within this impersonal force. And I think that notion that somehow we just, we just you know, turn our eyes and it all will work out, uh, that really got underway in the 1980s, in my view. And that's when the big assault on, um, on anything that would, per, one would, would enable people, for example, the minimum wage. The minimum wage has always been understood in my view, as a way to make sure that we can all participate in the market. Because as, as I was saying earlier, the, the democratic value is inclusion. De democracy says we all have a voice, right? The market is all about exclusion. If you don't have any money, you can't participate. So the way to bring democratic values to the market is to make sure we all can participate in it. And one of the ways that we've devised to do that, to keep the money circulating, is to have a minimum wage that people can live in decency with some dignity and be able to feed their kids. Well, our minimum wage has now sunk to a 56-year low in relation to the average wage. It's lost, another way of saying it, slightly different way of measuring it, it's lost 25% of its v purchasing power. So that, that, I think, you know, back to when did this happen, I, th I think it's been a gradual process, but I think the last 20, 25 years, there's been more and more of just believing somehow that we could just, uh, uh, that we did, there was nothing for us to do. It, that, that we citizens, we could just trust that something would, you know, sort of the, the big daddy would take care of it for us. And um, I, I think another theme of this book, Democracy's Edge, is that theme that it's that democracy is not about a should. It's not like I'm saying to my readers, oh, you selfish people, you should really care about the poor. You know, those of you who aren't, I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that we're all are hurting, that, um, uh, you know, when health care costs are going higher than the rate of inflation and we all are scrambling to be able to even to get the minimum care that we need, um, when, as I said, the drug prices here are twice what they are in Europe, when, when our, our, um, our air quality is such that a couple hundred people are dying every day because, you know, of the pollution, that we all are hurting from this and that getting engaged, and that's why I wrote this book with so many stories in it of real people. Because I think the voices in these people are voices filled with power, excitement, and even joy, because they don't feel like victims anymore. And I think one of the reasons that depression rates are growing in this country and around the world is this, is this idea, this false idea that somehow, you know, all we are is these selfish little shoppers, and, and people feel so diminished by that, whereas in, in my book, the kinds of people, I'd love to tell some of those stories, but um, are people who said, wait a minute, I'm much more than just a selfish little accumulator, you know, out there to get my own. I have a real voice in creating a, a community and a society and a world that works for all of us. And so it's, the book is really all about power, and I think that that sense of developing power in each of us 
is the antidote to and the the only way that that can wake us up from this notion you know you were asking me well, when does all this develop i think it developed with this idea that somehow you know we can just let 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 these big forces of the market make the decisions for us and uh, that is premised on the notion that we're incapable and more and more people are saying no i am capable and i want to be a, i want to be a problem solver not just a blame pusher power kind of has uh mixed messages you know on on the one hand we recognize that when the government wields it could be you know a good or a bad thing yet there seems to be a stigma as well when individuals get power that somehow that's bad they're going to misuse it yes well i think that's one of the things that i have learned uh, a lot of of from a lot of different people that power um, actually goes back to the root meaning of power in Latin is posse, just means to be able, our capacity to act. And yet when I've asked audiences over many years, you know, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word power? It's, you know, it's abuse, it's coercion, it's money, it's, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of, uh, you know, it's guns, it's, it's very negative. So part of my theme song here with Democracy's Edge is to say no. Power is just our capacity to act, and we c are creating power. The people in this book, uh, for example, one of my favorite people in the book is a woman, a grandmother in um, Arizona, Marge Mead, who kind of stumbled into a League of Women Voters meeting, and she was the only one who knew how to do shorthand, so she took the minutes and then became a leader in the effort in Arizona to get the power of money out of the political system as a number one, <laughs> you know, to get us going in, in a living democracy. And it just totally brought her to life. And her family and her kids, she had, you know, I don't know, a lot of kids and a lot of grandkids, and they all were just brought to life by their grandmother's initiative and this woman who'd never been involved in public life, so to speak, before. And so Marge, to me, is all about power. But it's not power to uh, abuse people, as we now see the images of prisoner, prisoner abuse and that sort of thing. It's not power that takes it away from somebody else. Marge Mead gaining power by launching herself into this area that she never, she said it was, first it was intimidating because campaign finance reform is a very complicated field, but she got into it and she mastered it all and she would go around and speak to churches and colleges and, and go door to door and it worked. And so to me, Marge is all about power building, but it's community. It's, it's yes, she was building her personal power, but also the power of everyone living in that state of Arizona. And actually last election in 2004, developers and other um, um, uh, President Bush affiliated um, groups, uh, you know, linked groups, really worked hard to overturn the public financing system in Arizona, and they failed. Um, so it's, it's, it's that, that's really what I'm talking about, really rethinking what do we mean by power, and power as our capacity to act together to create the world we want. Because um, I think what you know, what is so distressing to people is that you get up in the morning and you say, wait a minute, you know, as I was saying, not one of us, you think, what do we see after Katrina, right? The lid blew off and we saw poverty that none of us want in this country. We are shamed by that poverty. We saw cronyism that we associate with some two-bit, you know, dictator in some other country. We saw cronyism in FEMA, is what I'm referring to, is the friend of a friend of the president, not anybody who knew how to run an emergency relief program, Michael Brown. So we see cronyism. We see the lack of public financing. As the public sphere gets drained, <laughs> to keep with the metaphor of Katrina, but what happened is that the levees and other infrastructure that could have prevented some of that incredible damage had been underfunded uh, in the Corps of Engineers, et cetera. So that's another product of what I call thin democracy because money is drained out of the private, out of the public sphere where we need it to protect our lives and into private hands. So we saw a lot of the elements there. And I'm saying, you know, most of us are horrified by that. That's not the America that we love. And so 
I think it's not a question of telling people, oh, you should do something. It's offering people opportunities, like Marge discovered in Arizona for herself, uh, offering people opportunities to learn the skills of democracy and be effective and join with others on that that makes you the most energized. And that, that I think, is the key, finding the entry point that, that where your anger and your passion really connect. And it seems that a lot of this disempowering that has happened to citizens comes to us or is um, amplified by our media, where on a nightly basis, if you turn to the news, you know, you don't hear these stories. You, you, don't, you hear don't hear these stories. I, yes, and in, in the book, there is a whole chapter about uh, the, the problem of the debasement of the media as the media is turned into just any other commodity. One of the commissioners called uh, one, of the, one of the FCC, the communications commissioners, once equated the media, well, it's just, at, it's no different from a toaster. You know, it's, it's, it's just another commodity, in this case for selling commodities, rather than an instrument of democracy itself, the public conversation, as, as we're having here. So, but on the, so my, whole, my whole book is really this kind of, we're moving in two directions at once, and clearly, and so the choice is ours, and one of them is about the media, the debasement of the media. We do not hear these stories of empowerment. We hear these stories that make us feel, oh my God. <laughs> it's all over, you know. The, it's all wrapped up, and I'm not part of the wrap. Um, and but the good news, as, as as you're also aware, and we were talking before we began the interview about podcasting, about internet broadcasting, that is just blowing open. The uh, this is all happening so fast that the podcasting is not even in my media chapter because I finished it in April, and here we are in November. And uh, so that's how fast everything is happening. But so the excitement for me is that. Uh, there are three, well, this whole idea of living democracy, the idea that democracy is what we do, not what we have, and that we can become engaged and imbue the whole economy with democratic values um, in our lives in general, our education, I have a chapter on that too, that I see sort of three winds at our sails, if you will, and one of them has to do with the media, the democratization of communications, that clearly one of the most powerful forces for living democracy, something that is a rewarding way of life, not simply just this trudging to the polls to vote between the two least of two evils uh, kind of democracy. This living practice is, nothing is more central to it than the democratization of knowledge, of information, and not just being the recipient, but being the maker, being the transmitter, the creator of, of wisdom, the creator. So I, you know, I talk in the book about how just, you know, over in no time, we've moved to the point that the mainstream corporate media has to now respond to at least some of the blogger, uh, non-appointed, you know, news, news media, and in some cases very dramatic ways, like the, the, the fake reporter that the Bush administration got into the news briefings, that was exposed initially uh, by a blog, and then the corporate media had to say, okay, um, yeah, that really happened, and take it on. So... Uh, I think the, this is a powerful force for living tomorrow. It's very hard to keep a secret. And this is what is coming out now with the Scooter Libby um, and the um, Karl Rove investigations of who told, you know, who tried to dis discredit uh, Joseph Wilson for being a bearer of news that the administration didn't want to hear. Now, and I think that that's just another sign of how much harder it is to keep secrets today. So that's one force for living democracy, the transparency that, that open media allows. And the two others I, I talk about are um, what I call the revolution in human dignity. And that, I mean, this growing expectation, assumption, that the non-expert, the layperson, has something unique and invaluable to contribute to problem solving, that our direct experience accounts for so much. And so um, that, I mean, here in Seattle, I, I talk about Seattle in a couple of places in the book, but one of the most interesting, and it's in an earlier book of mine as well, where that revolution in human dignity is playing out in Seattle, is city government level. 
um, because this city is a an exemplar for the rest of the world, and its models of the matching grants program, for example, have been, you know, have been copied in in hundreds of other sites. But that notion that it's not just a matter of either leaving it to the individual or expecting government to do for us, but this idea of a real partnership and understanding that the local community um, has a great deal to offer in coming up with what is most needed in their communities. And it's very much tied into a phenomenon in Brazil that is now being mimicked in many other countries called participatory budgeting that does relate to the Seattle structure too, where local communities have a great deal to say about the allocation of public monies in their neighborhoods. So, the, But the revolution in human dignity I see uh, as part of what I'm talking about, because as long as we believe that we have to leave the answers to the experts or to the elected official because we're too ignorant or unskilled, uh, then living democracy is not really possible. And so I, this is happening in so many ways that it's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's just, uh, to me, one of the most dramatic uh, shifts. Uh, certainly it's been a long history, you know, beginning with the declaration that all people are created equal, but it is accelerating dramatically. And then the third piece that I see as the wind in the sails of living democracy is the ecological revolution. And that not just that it's a movement that is helping us to see that our acts um, have enormous impact and our carbon emissions are directly related to increased suffering from global warming, but that it is also, I think, seeping into our consciousness, that idea of connectedness, that we are letting go of the mechanical notion that, you know, we're each these little separate kind of cubicles or or little cogs and into the notion of networks so that yes every choice you know from I don't know what the coffee is I'm drinking here today but that actually if you were in this radio station buying fair trade coffee that you would be having a direct ripple right back into a family in Guatemala say that is now able to actually feed its kids, send them to school, and not uh, destroy the land because they're able to work with nature because they have a little more stable income and they can project their future. So those sorts of everyday choices, we now, I think, through this ecological consciousness of networking is, is very empowering that we can see more clearly the impacts of our everyday choices. And it's interesting, the overlap of the three different uh, wins that you were talking about, getting back to how uh, the media, again, corporate media, yes. reinforces different ideas that imprison us as citizens and humans. Again, the I idea that is just drilled into you um, via the media that, oh, I'm not an expert in that, therefore I shouldn't speak out, or oh, I'm only one person, what possible effect could my vote or actions, you know, have on the bigger picture? Yes, yes. No, it's the, the, the bombardment with messages that it is, yes, the experts, and also just the relentless advertising uh, that makes us feel that all that we're good for is shopping. You know, that, that is a pretty degrading notion, too. But I think it's really the stories that aren't told. And that's why in the 1990s I created a new service. I was determined uh, because I do believe that, you know, we are social mimics, that that's our nature. In fact, scientists have now discovered things called mirror neurons uh, that mean literally that uh, as you and I are watching each other, you now have a pen in your hand, that there are mirror neurons that are firing as if I were doing the same thing you're doing. So mimic is, is actually a brain fact as well as, as just kind of a social fact. And so I think the more that we can get these stories out there, I started a news service called the American News Service, and I dedicated this new book to people I work with there, the editors and the writers we had all over the country. We had great stories from Seattle, I must say. Um, but it, the idea, and we got these in mainstream media as long as we didn't charge for them. But when we started trying to charge for them, we just couldn't keep it going uh, because they said, well, how can you show us that this really helps the bottom line? Because it was all about the bottom line. And even though the, you know, the, the papers who ran our stories said this is great journalism, but the, when, the, when it came down to it, anyway. But the point is that uh, 
we can each be storytellers. We can each be storytellers. Since we humans live by stories and we're motivated by stories that we observe, no matter what you're doing with your life, uh, if you are taking that step toward bringing democracy to life, to life um, and to solve our problems, tell that story, make it visible, call and, and, and pre start to press the, the local media um, to cover those stories even more fully because that's how they multiply and others, others will hear about it and become and begin to see that more is possible than they thought. And of course that's why I wrote this book the way that I did. We were talking before uh, we began the interview about how you were much more excited about this current book than you had been about your previous works, which you have very many uh, previous works. Was one of the contributing factors the numerous uh, inspiring stories that you came across in researching this work? Well, I don't want to exactly say I'm more excited because it's like I have all these children and I don't want to say which one I prefer. It's not that exactly. It's I feel more revved up. I feel more like I've got to get out there no matter what it takes. Uh, and I think it's because uh, a number of things, but I feel that, that as a culture we are in such a choice point uh, that it feels so dire to me now. We see President Bush's ratings dropping and I think that many people could think, oh well, you know, if we could just somehow uh, move out this current uh, group of, 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 of um, Bush insiders that we'd be okay. And I don't believe that. I, I think that there's something much deeper here that we all have to be waking up to. And it is this great, we now see more than ever where this thin democracy has taken us. And we can either give up in despair or we can say, oh, right, now I know where this leads. This is leads right to where um, Franklin Delano Roosevelt warned us it would leave, lead and, and really undermine the most basic values. So I guess I feel more revved up about it just because I feel it's such a moment in American history where we can make that choice. And I, I feel that so many Americans are looking for a way to make sense of it all. And I just want to be of service in that because it's very hard to make sense of it all, and I, I feel so privileged that because I, of the news service I just mentioned, the American News Service, and the Center for Living Democracy, which I led for 10 years, that I had the privilege of just going around the country and learning about all this that is happening that is so positive, so creative, so effective. Uh, whether you're talking about democracy in our schools and how that is transforming children's lives, or the media we just talked about with the whole low power radio phenomenon and micro cinema phenomenon and, and, uh, and I mean, it's enormously impactful. Uh, um, so I feel like I feel like a missionary, <laughs> in the best sense of the word. That I feel like all the people in the book that I can be an ambassador for them. And I'm going to Bellingham tonight, for example, because in the book is a story about the local living economies movement there. That we don't have to just roll over and say, "Okay, Walmart take over." Okay, big corporate. A global companies take over, we'll just sit back and, and let our uh, communities be gutted. We don't have to do that. And so I feel maybe that's it. More than ever, I feel like I'm the, the voice. I have the privilege of being the voice for all these folks in the book that, that should be able to be celebrated and have their own voices out there. But at least I can help make that possible through telling their stories in this book. Um, and I, I, I so it's a lot of reasons, I think, the, but the dire situation and yet the hope uh, is so real for me. I mean, I, I said to an audience recently, I said, you know, when, when I began Diet for a Small Planet, I thought things would either get a lot worse or things would get a lot better. You know, people listen to me. And uh, it never occurred to me that both could happen. Things are getting much worse than I could have imagined and getting much better than I could have imagined. So I just want to help people to see that we can choose. We can choose life at this point. We can really choose to make this work and to let go of the magical thinking. And what is the edge in democracy's edge? Is that, to me, I mean, I'm kind of picturing this like cliff where we could <laughs> slip over into fascism or, you know, we could come up with a whole new paradigm yes, that we've exactly. been working for individually. All, all of that. Yeah, I give it three meanings. I, I chose that title 
it feels so right because yes, we are on the edge of losing the very values that you know the the, the essence of democracy is this wide dispersion of power and the voice of every citizen counting, and we have lost so much of that. So we are at the edge of exactly what Roosevelt warned us of: this fascism when private power takes over from the the public. The the private power is in charge, not the public voice. Um, but but I also, I, I chose that title because I think democracy gives us an edge, that it's not weak, it's strong. And what is really weak is thin democracy because it's not credible. It's not credible. You know, we, it's, it's a joke when we have peop, see people like Michael Brown in charge of FEMA, or we see the way that uh, the Iraq war has been carried out, where so many most basic questions were un answered before we went in and so now we have this disaster there so that to me is also uh, a, a symptom of thin democracy that it um, that it is weak but democracy gives us an edge real democracy living democracy is strong because it it makes us all feel that we're owners that we have a voice and we'll be loyal and, and committed to building it uh, so it gives us an edge, and then the third meaning is that the people in the book are pushing the edge and extending the edge for the rest of us so that we're not going to fall off the fall off the edge. So democracy's edge has these multiple meanings for me, and um, so that, that's, that's why I, I chose that title, but it goes very much with my previous book that I did with my daughter. I feel it's part of this trilogy, and that's why I don't want to play favorites among my children here. Um, my children being my books, um, as well as my real children. But um, it's a trilogy, and the first of the trilogy is Hope's Edge, which is the de international uh, kind of sister to Democracy's Edge, where my daughter and I travel on five continents looking at what is emerging that is breaking through this very negative mental math that tells us that we're nothing but these selfish little accumulators and have to turn over our fate to this impersonal market. And so we, we have stories from five continents, uh, including this one. Um, and then in the middle is a book called You Have the Power, Choosing Courage in a Culture of Fear. And it's the, the fulcrum, the, sort of the center of this, because unless we can walk with our fear in a new way, see fear in a new light, we, we can't, I think, make the step to living democracy. And then the third being democracy's edge. So to me, it's, it's, they all are of a piece because Clearly, we are connected internationally, and what I'm talking about in terms of living democracy is happening throughout the world with bottom-up citizen movements that are bringing democracy alive in other countries, even in very, very poor countries. Can you talk about some of the more uh, inspiring examples that you have run across in researching your book? Well, I, I'll just make, mention a couple of people uh, that tie into the core themes here. And in the beginning of the interview, I said that, that living democracy is about um, removing the power of money from the political process and, and infusing the power of democracy into the economic process. So, and I talked earlier about Marge Mead in Arizona as the first piece of that. But the second piece, how do we infuse democratic values into economic life so that we just don't check out our values when we when we engage in shopping or in any aspect of, of our economic lives. So I'll just think of a couple of people. One that has a Seattle dimension to it is a young man named Mike Brune, who I talked to um, for this book. And Mike was, as a teenager, lived on a barrier island off the coast of New Jersey. And one of his summers was ruined because all his teenage friends would hang out on the beach. And one summer, the beach was just unusable because of washing up of a lot of junk, a lot of toxic junk, and Greenpeace came in and helped them sort out and to to uh, sort out that whole problem, and that changed his life. And now Mike was selected when he was less than 30. He was made head of the Rainforest Action Network program to end gro old growth uh, purchases, uh, old growth. Um, from starting with Home Depot to stop Home Depot from buying wood that was, you know, harvested from old growth because we've lost so much of that. I think the, we're losing the equivalent of the entire Great Britain every year in terms of old growth wood. So here this, you know, to me, my, you know, that's a kid, uh, 
maybe he was 30 by then, I don't know, but they put him in charge of this. And it is such a lesson to me about how the corporation we see as a monolith is actually a product, and we, if we bring it into the democratic fold, we can, we can um, begin to build in accountability to our values. So what they did is they had a multi, they meaning Rainforest Action, Mike in this case, they had stockholders who brought a ballot initiative in the shareholders meeting to insist that Home Depot only use the uh, non-old growth wood, and then they they reached out to people in the company because you know it's not like these were all bad people. They but they wanted to keep their jobs. So somebody in Home Depot, a manager, called Mike and said, you know, I don't want to lose my job, but I also want to be able to take my daughter to the rainforest someday. So how can I help you? And he ended up giving the code the intercom code for all the Home Depot stores, he gave it to Mike. And Mike then uh, got that into the hands of all of his, you know, his uh, members out there, you know, retired people, students, you know, anybody who would help out, and they would go into the Home Depot stores. And with their code, they would get online and say, special sale on old growth wood in aisle 23, and then go into a little rap about what the problem is. Well, the, the, the exciting thing for me is that even though the shareholders only voted, 12% of them voted, right, to stop this practice, nonetheless, the president of the company said, you know, they got word again from the inside that we don't want to see this protest. We want it to go away. And within a few months, Rainforest Action got a fax saying that, got a fax from uh, Home Depot saying that they would abide by the, and phase out the use of old growth. Not only that, that they would take the lead and they would, they would um, that then be a model that then began to, to affect other home improvement centers. And then, of course, Mike started negotiating with Weyerhaeuser. <laughs> and I was so struck by this example of this young person. And I said, you know, what, how, what, how do you get to the point where Weyerhaeuser is actually flying down executives to sit at your table and negotiate with you. I mean, please, I don't want to sound sexist. I mean, excuse me, not sexist, ageist, but you know, you're just a kid. <laughs> How can this be? And he said, he was very gentle. He said, um, he didn't get too upset with my ageism. And he said, it's because they know we're not going away. And who is the we here? The we is just ordinary citizens who didn't break any laws. They, they used some inside information from somebody who shared their values inside the company and they took the shareholders uh, with them who would, who would go with them and in the end they triumphed and, and, um, and actually began to then negotiate with this huge multinational. So it's a story to me about what it means to embed huge economic entities like these giant multinationals in in democratic values and not I'm not by any means saying that that is going that story says that you know this is all well and good but my book is about all those entry points so that's one of them in which we can begin to bring economics back into democracy and another um, I'll tell this more quickly another young person Lena Musayev is in my book and another uh, uh, much younger uh, uh, college student at George Washington University who goes to a training session a, couple, a week or a few days in, in Boston with Oxfam America and she gets introduced to some farmers from Guatemala who are going uh, out of business working day in and day out to grow coffee and yet not being able to survive and she realizes and t <laughs> and this is one one session that oh my goodness I could go back to my college and bring forth a fair trade purchasing policy on my campus and I could directly help to make sure that these families got a fair pay and so she did she went back and that was just a couple of years ago and now because of Lena um, and her roommate uh, there are now 300 campuses that are buying fair trade coffee and so what that says to me is that it's beginning to shift the norm that the norm has to go if we are to save ourselves and our planet and that is that everyone is is deserving of and and has to be paid a, a fair wage for their labor. And um, so 
this is beginning not just, I think, to help these particular farmers who are now, there are now 800,000 globally who are benefiting from fair trade priced coffee through the Sitterfine network, uh, that we can now go into a Brugger's, for example, and get fair trade coffee, and it's sold in so many supermarkets now. But we are, that's also shifting the norm so that we will be then saying, of course, absolutely, of course, that w we can't survive as a, as, as, as a people if we live in a world where billions, uh, I think two billion people, uh, two billion workers in the world are now paid uh, no more than two dollars a day, something on that order, that in that world uh, there will be continued instability, there will be continued misery, and we, we have to set this basic floor of decency. So these are examples of very practical things that people are doing that are saying, yeah, a market economy is a good thing, but it, it can only function if it is embedded in democratic values, because left to its own devices, it just returns wealth to those who already have it. So it sounds inspiring then that you're drawing examples that seem to point to people basically finding new ways of coming up with new solutions to, in many ways, would be problems we've been dealing with for a long time. You know? Problems we've been dealing with for a long time. But, and I hope that, that by having a frame of understanding that these are not random acts of sanity, you know, that there is a framework here. And I think that that's what we're looking for. That's not a new ism. Because I think that, um, appropriately, we've gotten to the point where we're very suspicious of blueprints very suspicious of some new ism that's going to solve it for us. And uh, so I, I think that what we're looking for is some guiding principles, and that's what living democracy means to me, that it's not a formula. We, it's very, um, it's organic in that sense. It's sort of the social analog to democracy, I mean, to, to ecology itself. And so that's why I, I think that that it's so powerful is yes these are individual stories uh, and I could go on and on because you know we cover the media and education and security but that they cohere as well it's they're not just random acts of either protest or innovation they cohere in, in the these ways of these principles of, inf of infusing democratic values there's there's a consistency here a consistency about fairness uh, transparency, accountability, uh, inclusion. Um, I, I was on a radio program uh, just this week. I've started these interviews, of course, and I was telling the story of um, of Powell, Wyoming, because to me it speaks to the whole debate about Walmart. Now there's a lot in the press about Walmart and how much we are paying. I mean, billions of dollars in public benefits uh, that Walmart Walmart employees are eligible for. Uh, billions of dollars in federal uh, subsidies because they are so poor. And so that means the taxpayers are picking up. And there's a big debate about Walmart, and yet people feel so helpless relative to this company. And so I was telling the story of Powell, Wyoming, where the department store uh, left town, the department store closed, and a Walmart was going to move in, and the town said, no, 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 there's going to be another way. They stood up for their own interest. 429 families, I think, each put in $400, and they started their own community-owned department store that was such a huge success that it expanded another 1,000 square feet or so within the first year. The dividends going back into the community, not to Bentonville or whatever it is, Arkansas, the headquarters of, of Walmart, and it's enormous success. So I'm telling the story to a radio interviewer, um, and he said, oh, it sounds like socialism. And I was thinking later how I should have said, which I, now I'm going to say what I should have said then, but, uh, I, you know, isn't it interesting? Isn't it kind of amusing but sad that we're at the point where democracy sounds like socialism to you? Because to most people, I think socialism means some state, uh, uh, state top-down state decision-making, and here nothing could be more bottom-up than these citizens of Powell, Wyoming, saying, no, we're going to do it ourselves, succeeding at that so much that now busloads of visitors come in from other towns that have lost their downtown department stores and seeing how they could do it. Um, but, but I think it's, that again, the mental map. 
what ism does this fit? And this lady is talking about living democracy. It must be some old ism. And uh, so this particular news interviewer put it into the socialism box um, because it didn't seem to fit the capitalism box, whereas what I'm really talking about is not a newism, and it, there's not an end point. And one of the quotes I love in this book uh, from William Hasty, who was the first black federal judge in America, he said, democracy is, n is not being, it is becoming. It is easily lost, but never fully won. Its essence is eternal struggle. And I used to sort of swallow that last line, eternal struggle, because it sounded so dreary. But now that I've written this book, I, I see that term struggle in a very different light. It's that it's the good fight. It's the it's the really the excitement of knowing that you're making history. And so these folks in Powell, Wyoming, just like the folks in Bellingham and the people in Seattle that that I talk about in the Matching Grats program, I really believe they're making history by showing a different way to do democracy that doesn't match any of these you know, formulaic ways of thinking. And like you just said, it sounds like one of the similarities here, too, amongst all these uh, efforts is they're, they're all bottom-up. Yes, they are. They're bottom-up, but they're not saying that government doesn't have a role. It's, it's this, again, it, it's not this simple either-or, you know, government does it or we do it. It's, it's, it's the, coming back to Seattle, you know, this idea of the matching grants, it, it, is, this, it is this sense that government has a place. Uh, but that citizens do too. Um, and so uh, clearly government, for example, in setting a, a, a living wage, I mean, that it has to be a public, um, a public standard that is, is put under a floor of decency under us. So we, government is absolutely essential in setting floors of decency, but it's citizens who are only by active engagement is that possible to, um, to ensure that government sets the standards and enforces those standards. So um, it is not, you know, an either or, because clearly in this highly complex world, we need government and we certainly need government protections in terms of uh, pharmaceutical industry and, and, you know, and, and in food and from food pathogens and all of that sort of things, which, you know, it was only in doing this book that, that I learned, uh, I should have known given that I focus so much on food, but the government doesn't even have the power to recall food. It's voluntary. Uh, again, because of the food industry. Um, and yet, you know, we've had these huge uh, recalls of, of food, but, uh, and, and, and um, many people, you know, die every year from food, from food related illnesses. So clearly we need government, but um, it is not this either or. Uh, that, that, I think, is the key to this book. We have just been talking with Francis Moore LePay, author of the new book, Democracy's Edge, Choosing to Save Our Country by Bringing Democracy to Life.